This Week in Startups is brought to you by Clavio helps brands build relationships across any distance, delivering email marketing moments your customers will appreciate, remember, and share in good times and bad. Visit clavio.com slash twist today to start your free trial. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist. And Fiverr. Find the perfect freelance services for your business. Go to fiverr.com and use code twist to receive 10% off your first order. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, an angel investor here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, If you'd like to apply to our accelerator, it has now moved to virtual, which means uh, over four months uh, and about 20 sessions, we introduce you to over 500 investors. They hear your pitch and uh, then you contact them. And hopefully that's the top of your funnel with no work on your part. The only work you have to do is really build a great business that grows 10, 20 percent month over month and then meet those investors and close in a round of investing. And it's now all virtual. You can apply at launch.co slash apply. If you want to come to the accelerator, if you've got a great idea, anytime you can DM me on Twitter. I'm at Jason and you can email me jason at calacanis.com. My guest today uh, is the man behind a lot of the seed funds you've heard of. Um, He runs something called Sendana. How do you pronounce it? Sendana. Sendana. It's a Malaysian word for sandalwood. Sandalwood, sandana. Uh, And his name is Michael Kim. Uh, Welcome to the program, finally. Uh, We've been trying to organize this for a while. Uh, My hope uh, family is safe, everybody is healthy. Uh, Yep, recording this for historical purposes during the once in a hundred year pandemic known as COVID-19. Right. Um, How are you doing psychologically at your job, which is being a fund of funds? I think things are going actually pretty well um, in terms of, you know, operating the business, working with our fund managers, looking at new opportunities. Um, You know, I was just thinking that uh, unlike a direct investor, we can actually spend a lot of time with fund managers over the phone and and on Zoom. And so, you know, I I would say that it's a different world, of course, but uh, I think we're adapting to it and... You know, we're finishing up raising our fund, a new one. And uh, that, luckily for us, most of that was done already before a shelter in place. And so, you know, I feel like things are going pretty well, actually. Fantastic. And explain to people who are listening who have, they know what a seed, they know what an angel investor is, they know what a seed fund is, they know what a venture fund is, they invest right. money on behalf of LPs. What is a fund of funds and why do they exist? Sure. So, um, you know, a fund of funds, we're basically an investment management firm. We raise capital from institutional LPs, from family offices, and from individuals. And then we take that capital and we invest it with other fund managers. So uh, one use case, for example, is um, the University of Texas, which is our largest investor. And they are so large that they cannot write small checks. And so to access the seed market, where funds are generally under $100 million, you know, they work through us. Or take, for example, um, a small foundation like the National Public Radio Foundation uh, in Washington, D.C. They don't really have a full-time investment staff, and so they outsource the investing to us. Or, for example, a family office may have one or two people who are working their asset allocation, but they can't spend the time to execute on a strategy for um, something like seed investing. So they work through us. So effectively, we're a way for uh, pools of capital to outsource their investments in um, in a particular field. And for us, it's, it's seed investing. And what I'm reading into that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it takes a certain amount of expertise and time and effort to really pick a seed fund or a new manager. Sure. And they, it's just not either worth the time or they're just under resource based on the size of what they're doing. Right. So I I started Sundana in 2010, took about 18 months to raise the first fund. Back then there were probably 10 to 15 seed funds that were institutional in quality, meaning that, you know, endowments and foundations would back them. 
Um, and if you be- remember back then, there were the 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 phrase "super angel." You don't yes. really hear that that often, but you know a lot of the super angels like Jeff Clavier actually became professional institutional quality fund managers. And you know, I think um, the taxonomy would be that you know angels are using their own capital to make investments into companies. Super angel were using um, they were using their own capital, but doing that job full time. That was their full time job. And then you know now you have institutional quality seed funds where you're where these fund managers are are managing outside capital. And so you know it's a significant commitment for a fund manager to do that because number one, it's other people's money. You have to be a fiduciary to it. And number three, it's for twelve years. And so you know as you raise more and more funds, you can see how. Um, a fund manager with fund one can suddenly be into it for three or four funds and like 25 years of their life has gone by. And so it, it's a very different kind of mentality that you want to take outside capital and, and manage it. How, how, what is the average check size for you? So if you were going to be in one of Jeff's funds and he's been on the pod right. a couple of times over right. the last decade, uh, uncorked capital previously, soft tech VC, um, what would yeah. it, what a, ch- a typical slug be for you? So you have a hundred million or two hundred million or three hundred million dollar fund. And you put ten million, five million into X number right. of funds. How does it work? So so this is what you're asking about is portfolio construction, and that's something that we really focus on the fund managers that we look at. We we you know we really get into what is your portfolio construction, number mm-hmm. of companies, what kind of checks you're writing, how much you have in reserves. So for portfolio construction for us. We actually look at the world in three buckets. We look at seed, pre-seed, and international. So seed funds, I think, generally speaking, are around 80 to $100 million. They're investing in companies that have initial product market fit. They have some traction, whether it's in form of you know, users or, or actual revenue, and some management team. Pre-seed, on the other hand, is investing into um, a PowerPoint, into an idea. They may mm. just be one or two co-founders. Um, and then international is all of that, but outside the U.S. So we, we, we divide the world into three buckets. And um, for each bucket, we write a different kind of check. So we think of it uh, as core. So for a core check, we would write $15 million into a seed fund, and then seven and a half to um, both pre-seed and international. But we also have a pilot program where we write $1 million checks to groups that we like, but we have some question about their strategy or story, whether it's geography or sector they're pursuing ah. or, or business model. So those are kind of try before you buy. We make those investments with an eye toward converting them into a core. But um, you know, it, it's it's just a way that we can engage with fund managers, be relevant in the market. And the, re- the reason why I say it that way is there are plenty of fund of funds who raise their pool of capital and all they do is just re-up with their existing managers. Maybe drop one, add one. Mm-hmm. I think you know, by doing a pilot program, and we do f- five for each of those buckets, you know, that's 15 new managers that we're working with. So I think it lets us stay very relevant and, and, and keep an eye on, on how the market is. But to answer your question specifically, you know, so with someone like Jeff Clavier, uh, we are his largest LP, and we, we wrote him a $20 million check, actually. Yeah. And so when we get back from this quick break, I want to know how you assess new fund managers. Yep. In uncertain times, supporting your community and growing relationships with your customers will be appreciated, remembered, and shared. In good times and bad, open and empathetic communication with your customers is absolutely key, and email will always be the best channel for communicating with your customers. We all know that. You guys get emails from me all the time. Well, email marketing is one of Clavio's core offerings. When you leverage personalization driven by a 360-degree view of your customers, emails will feel more relevant and foster stronger relationships. You know all about your customers, but why would you send just one email to all of them? One size does not fit all. Clavio understands how challenging it is for each and every entrepreneur to get their businesses off the ground, let alone navigate trying times like today. So if you're feeling overwhelmed with growing your business, especially in this climate, you're not alone and Clavio is here to help brands build relationships across any distance. If you're a D2C brand, direct to consumer, you need to use Clavio. They integrate seamlessly with Shopify and it's going to jumpstart and just 
give you a huge push in the back, wind in your sails in terms of conversions. Here's your call to action. Create meaningful, memorable email marketing moments that last a lifetime. Visit klaviyo.com slash twist to start your free trial right now. Let me spell that for you. K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist. Klaviyo is spelled K-L-A-V-I-Y-O. K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back. Michael Kim is our guest today. He he runs a fund of funds. Uh, Sendana. Did I get it right? Sendana. 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 Dana. My, my dyslexia flaring up. Sendana. Uh, you've been doing this uh, for a while now, huh? About 10 years. 10 yep. years. And you've done three or four funds in that time? Yeah. As I mentioned, we're finishing up raising our new fund and that's fund four. Um, Congratulations. And so, Thank you. And, um, you know, I think, I think what, one thing that really has served us well in terms of how we do this is that we're very focused. So we're focused on seed, as I was mentioning. And, you know, I think in terms of the fund managers, um, you know, part of the black box of how we think about fund managers is we actually, we look for the fund managers who have that credibility to lead their investments because we think ownership is paramount. Yeah. And so, you know, why is ownership paramount? What does it mean? Ownership is paramount. So if you take on the one hand, a group that's putting in hundred K checks and they're getting 1% and the average exit in venture is about a hundred million, you know, they're getting a a million dollar return on their hundred K check. So that's a 10 X multiple, but a million dollar return on a $60 million fund doesn't move the needle. Hmm. But if you're a $60 million fund and you own 15%, so you're getting 15 million back. That's you've you've just returned a quarter of your fund at 100 million dollars, and that's so, why we think ownership is paramount. What is the ownership a seed fund should have sitting here in 2020? What is an impressive number for you that would make you want to be involved with that fund? Generally speaking, our core managers get 10 to 20 percent. I would say it averages out to about 12 to 13. Um, but also, if you look at our pre-seed managers, they're getting 15 to 20% with a smaller check. And so it, it depends on the type of strategy you're doing, whether it's pre-seed or seed. And also, it, our international funds, you know, they're investing in companies at sub $2 million pre's that already have some track and, traction. So you know, I think, like in everything, it, it depends. But in general, we would want to see 10 to 20% ownership. And I would also say that you know, if you're a first-time fund manager and you're running a 10 to $20 million fund, you don't need to get the 15% ownership. Um, you, you should do the math and think through at an average exit of $100 million, will I get a material um, return to the fund? And with like a 5% ownership at, in, in your $10 million fund, that, that, that math works out, actually. And when you look at fund managers, you know, it's pretty well established what people look for in founders, personality traits. We talk about it all the time on this podcast. I talk about it all the time when I'm talking to LPs um, and when I'm running the syndicate.com. What do you look for, not in founders, but in for managers? Is there a personality type? Is there signaling? Is there a pattern of who makes a great fund manager over time? That's an excellent question. I think um, at a high level, I would say that you know we look at people's networks, we look at their drive, we look at their um, vision and what they want to do for the their their firm. And you know, I think um, if you look at if you talk to all of our fund managers, uh, another sort of unique characteristic is that they're all very nice people. So I would say that we actually look for that and. You know, I think uh, perhaps it's a it's a virtuous circle or a cycle in that the 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 people who play fair, who have high integrity and are 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 nice to work with, are the ones who are actually able to lead these investments because the founders want to work with them. And is there something between being an operator or being a finance person that has hashed yeah, itself out uh, in right. terms of what's desirable in a fund manager? Everybody talks about growth people or product people being sought after. Yeah, what are your thoughts I, I would, there? Yeah, so if you look at our fund managers, I would say at least two thirds of them actually were ex entrepreneurs that had their own startup, venture backed, exited, and you know, a good example would be like Founder Collective, you know, Eric Paley and Dave Frankel, um, and and Micah Rosenblum, um, or we also have a handful of people who 
like Tim Connors was at Sequoia and then at USVP. So he's someone who came from a bigger firm. And then we have people like Kirsten Green, who you know was deep into the commerce space initially as an equity research person, and then uh, in later stage and then earlier stage. So I would say it's a mix, but uh, about two thirds of our fund managers are entrepreneurs, and that's very important and ties to the fact that we want to see these people who have the credibility to lead their investments because the founders want to work with them because they've had that experience in the field. Now, if you look at later stage firms, a lot of them are actually ex-bankers and lawyers. So it's a different kind of skill set. Um, but I think at the seed stage and probably series A, you'd want to see uh, former operators and people who have the, uh, experience running uh, teams and, ma- and managing um, you know, P&L. And how do you diligence these uh, funds. So when I diligence a company, I'm talking to the customers. I'm assuming when you diligence a, fa- a manager, you talk to their previous investments or you talk yeah. to other co-investors. How does that process work of selecting which sure. venture fund you back? Which yeah. seed fund Let me you just back? give you an example yeah. I've actually said publicly before. Yeah. So hopefully uh, she won't mind. But you know, when we were starting to work with Kirsten Green, this is back in 2011, you know, she had a small pool of capital that she had raised from a friend and she was making these investments. And so, you know, she was out she set out to raise a forty million dollar institutional fund. We ultimately committed ten million to her, so we were a quarter of her capital. But the way we did diligence is I would call. I called all the portfolio CEOs, and to use an example, you know, um, we were talking to the Warby Warby Parker founders, and they were saying, "Yes, Kirsten is the first person we call for advice. It's the first person mm. we would call at 11 p.m. if we were worried about something. She has tremendous domain expertise." And then, you know, the natural question I would ask uh, that would I would follow up with is, if she had a a, a much larger fund, could you have envisioned her leading your round? And they absolutely all said, you know, completely. So, you know, when you hear 40 founders say that, you kind of get the sense that, yes, someone like Kirsten Green can lead an inv- lead a round and, um, you know, with an institutional sized fund. How, how does a fund of funds make money? How do you make money um, investing? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. So, just to use an example, our first fund is about a 3x. And what that means is, you know, we've invested um, X and it's now worth three times that. And um, what the, the, how, the, how it all works through is that, you know, fund managers like Forerunner or Jeff Clavier, you know, their portfolios are increasing in size. And as they exit companies like, you know, like um, if, if Fitbit, for example, to use Jeff's company, Jeff's firm, you know, they would send us a distribution. So, you know, for example, um, we, uh, so as we, we started getting distributions, uh, you know, I send that to our LPs and, uh, I think ultimately that's, what's most important is how much cash we're sending back to our LPs and, you know, cash on cash money. Yeah. Mo- what is that? Multiple on invested capital. Well, you know, I mean, people talk about their multiples. So they're like, oh yeah, we're 5X fund. But then you ask them, how much have you actually distributed back to your LPs? It might be 0.5 because all of it's paper gain, right? right? And so I would say that LPs are very focused on getting cash back. And, you know, I'm very proud that our funds are actually, two of our funds are already in the carry, meaning that we've actually returned more than the capital invested, Um and well, so, and that's that says something because it takes typically ten years for these investments to be realized. My Uber right. investment didn't get well. I was able to sell a little bit earlier on, but um, generally speaking, these things don't get realized until year eight, nine, ten. Typically, that's right. And I would say that looking back in the last twelve months, a lot of it actually has been some secondary. So, oh, really? These, these companies are getting to unicorn level, and these rounds are like. 200 million on a billion five, then our fund managers actually have that sort of degree of freedom to actually sell into that round. And they may Should sell they? all of it. Should well, they? that's a good question. You know, so. Because I was taught by Sequoia, never sell. Hold. Right. So there's, a, so the, so the answer is that most of our fund managers, when they do secondary sell 20 to 30%. Got so it. they're still, they're getting their, uh, they're getting capital and, and then some back. But uh, they're, you know, they still have a significant amount on the table. And what I would also say is that just because a company becomes a unicorn level, um, you know, a lot of bad things can happen. So if a company is 
raising capital at a billion five, the new investor comes in, they probably want a three X from there, right? So then you're looking at, you know, something like a four and a half billion dollar exit valuation. A lot of things can go wrong between mm. that billion and a half to four and a half billion. CEO could get you know replaced. Uh, there could be you know the growth could slow down. Then there's a down round. There's mm. a pay to play round. And so we actually have been advising our fund managers from the get go. If you have like a 10x mm. NAV on a company, consider selling some of that NAV. Net asset value. So, like, if you have uh, you know, a million dollars in a company and it's now worth ten million because of markups, then you might want to consider selling a third of that, so mm. you get three million back, and you know, you, you've banked three million on your one million dollar investment, but you still have seven. I did know, this writing. with Com. dot com. We sold a little bit at the two hundred fifty million, ten percent at the two hundred fifty million dollar right. valuation. Now uh, it's been public. It's at a one point whatever three or four billion dollar valuation. So. A cynical person would look at that and say, oh my God, you idiot. There was a 4X in two years that you missed out on by selling that 10. Yeah. But we were able to book our investors, whatever it was, a three or 4X cash on cash win with 90% remaining. So I took the idiot insurance. Yeah, exactly. Good move or bad move? I think that's a brilliant move. Brilliant. And, Should I have done 20 know, or 30? <laughs> Should I do another well, there, 10 now? Tell me. What, you, what I would tell you is that there are tell examples me what to do. where- where actually uh, the the founders are doing secondaries and they're making more money than ultimately the venture capitalists because the company might go to zero actually, and right. there are some examples of that um, out there. And you know, I I, I would say where that- the founders just so we recap what you just said, there are examples of a founder selling in secondary. They're selling their common shares, so they sell ten million dollars worth, five million dollars worth. The VCs haven't booked a win yet. Even the seed funds haven't booked a win yet. Correct. And then it goes to zero. Correct. Which is and, crazy when you think about it. Yeah, and and but it, and it used to be in venture that you know VCs would not really look f- kindly upon secondaries until much much later stage. But you, you actually hear of secondaries being done at Series A and B. And, we just had you know, second. Think, we just had it happen with Clubhouse, where the founders took a million dollars off. Exactly each. right um, at the hundred million dollar value. The cynical version of the interpretation of that is you paid for the deal. You paid the founders off to get the deal. That would be the cynical look at it. You as an if you as a fund manager, fund manager, if one of your fund managers said to win this deal, we have to give, you know, eight million in primary, two million to the founders. As the steward of capital, fiduciary, and let's just say it's a great company, it looks like a great investment, on a pre-launch company or a first year company, would you uh, advise them to do it or not do it? You think it's a bad precedent? You think it's a okay thing to do? Answer that question when we get back on this week in startups. The way we work has changed overnight, and if there's one thing we've learned, having access to the right resources is essential for adapting your business. 2020 has been full of uncertainty, and every business needs a plan for the unexpected. Finding the right talent can be so time-consuming and frustrating and expensive, of course. Well, that's where Fiverr can help. Fiverr's Marketplace connects you and your business with freelancers offering hundreds of digital services, including the important stuff like graphic design, copywriting, often overlooked, web programming, film editing. You get the idea. Whether you're launching your first business or you're scaling your current startup and you need extra support, Fiverr's global network of on-demand freelancers is here to help you find what you're looking for instantly. It's so easy. Customize your search by service, like copywriting, super important, deadline, like next week, and what price you're willing to pay. And then look at the reviews, and you'll know exactly what you're paying for up front. There is no negotiation needed. They have 24-hour, seven-day-a-week customer support to help you, and a network of qualified talent that you can count on. We've used Fiverr many times at launch, from web developers at our event websites to graphic designers, and our portfolios pitch decks. So Fiverr has always been there to supply experienced talent for us and they will be there for you, especially in this tumultuous time. There's so much you've got to get done. You're under-resourced like all startups. Well, Fiverr is going to help you and here's your call to action. You get 10% off. That's right, 10% off your first order by using my code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, as in This Week in Startups. So I want you to visit Fiverr.com slash twist. That's F-I-V-E-R-R dot com, two R's fiverr.com slash twist all right michael kim is with us you can follow him on the twitter mk rocks at mk rocks uh 
So that was my gamer tag, actually. Was it really? <laughs> what do you? That's how I what do you play? What do you play? You were, you're a World of Warcraft guy. You're a wizard. You're a bard. Are you a Call you of know, Duty sniper? The, are you a Starcraft Protoss? What are you? You know, I used to play a lot of Call of Duty, and um, I started playing video games back in the '90s when I had my Sega. And I was playing NHL hockey. You can knock Wayne Gretzky out, and yeah. uh, blood would Beautiful. pour out of his head, just like the Beautiful. movie Swingers. But um, you know, I haven't played recently, but I used to play a lot of Call of Duty at one point, and this would be on uh, on Xbox. So as, I was a console gamer, not a keep, you know PC gamer. And the best I ever uh, reached was sort of about two hundred fifty thousand out of ten million. So I was in the top two and a half percent. Really, uh, kill death ratio? What's the uh- yeah, that was pretty good. You know, good. I, 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 I actually was not a sniper. I never was able to do that that well. But I snipe. I was, I'm a sniper. Okay. <laughs> but that's just my angel investing. It's also what I do in Call of Duty. Yeah. Snipe it. Boom. Headshot. That'd be an interesting study. Like, what's your gaming style versus your investing style? If there's any correlation. Yeah, there's something about sniping that is just so rewarding that you're oh, just. Yeah. If oh. you can do it, it's amazing. For sure. Yeah, it takes it takes a, a little bit of patience and also. You know, half the time you wind up having like a an AR-15 pointed in your face as you're like camped out on the ground, and you just like look up and you're like, ah, you're right. Boom, 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 boom. right. All right, back to the secondary. Yep. Uh, one of your fund managers comes to you and says, "Hey, forget about Clubhouse. You know, could be unique circumstances, et cetera. Um, previous relationship with the founders, et cetera, et cetera. But just what would your general feeling be, and how would you talk to me if I was one of your fund managers about that approach? Twenty percent of your dollars and your LP's dollars." Going towards the founders pre-launch, you know, or first right. year launch. I mean, ultimately, you know, you're right. Cynically, you could view it as buying buying the deal. Um, you could also make the argument that it, it allows the founders to execute on the company and not worry about near term cash flows. Um, I think that ultimately, if the company is very successful, then that two million is is well spent. If not, then you know, I think every institutional LP goes into a, a venture capital fund, eyes wide open and expects substantial losses. And so they're actually looking for that unicorn, that decacorn to actually return multiples of the fund. And in the case of Clubhouse, maybe it will be, maybe it'll turn out to be like Meerkat, who knows, right? And, um, you know, ultimately, um, I think I think that LPs recognize that venture is, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, you basically have one or two major hits per fund, and if you and if if Clubhouse, the way that Andreessen got the deal is, it, it works out, then you know I think all is forgiven. Yeah, Th- and that is the nature of these funds. When you look at a fund, and you see shutdown after shutdown after shutdown, that to you is not a negative signal. It's no. the magnitude of the win. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you have to, it, what, what's actually remarkable is that we, over, we have over 1,600 companies in our portfolio. 40 are unicorns. Over 160 are actually valued at 100 million or more, you know, and I mentioned that's it that way. That's exceptional because that's 10%, wait, 10% are valued in nine figures or more, which we'd have to know when you invested, but still that's incredible. They were all seed. They were, they were all, seed. all seed entry. Right. Wow. Entry point was seed. We have about 10% of our portfolio that are now over 100 million and 40 that are, uh, you know, unicorns. And Which one was the biggest out of all of those, of the 40 unicorns, which was the biggest ultimate success? Cash on cash. um, Top three, maybe. For our fund managers, I would say- Well, for uh, you, actually, I was thinking, but yeah. Cash on cash. Well, so we actually- so. We have a fund of funds business, but and that's predominantly what we do. But we actually also make direct investments. So uh. we're investing with our fund managers into companies. And in our first direct fund, we were a Series A Dollar Shave Club. We were a Series yum, A yum. Casper. We were a Series B Honey. And we were um, yum, Series yum. C in Looker. And right. so- Wow. So you make more from those ultimately, or do you make more from the indexed fund, do you think? I mean, ultimately, you know, if you think about the risk reward profile, it's a continuum. You know, investing in a company directly, you have the highest potential return, but you also have a potential for zero. If you invest in a fund, you know, more than likely most funds don't go to zero, but they can lose money. If you invest in a fund of funds, it's so diversified that the returns are probably muted 
you know, certainly compared to a, a direct investment in a company. Uh, but there's almost no chance of actually getting to a zero. And so, you know, that's the risk reward profile. And um, I think what we, the way we think about this is that we have our fund to fund business. It has amazing portfolio companies from our fund managers. It's all because of the fund managers that we have an opportunity to invest in some of these companies directly. And so, you know, we are very fortunate to be in a company like Honey, which, you know, for, for the mucker guys actually returned something like 28x their entire fund. Yeah, man. <laughs> It was amazing, right? And but you know we have guys like Roger Ehrenberg at IA Ventures, and you know he owned seventeen percent of Trade Desk when it went public, and he owned a substantial portion of Datadog, and those are co- those are companies that are are twenty billion dollar market caps now. You know Manu Kumar at K9 Ventures was a seed investor in Twilio, in Carta, and Lyft, and you know Twilio and um, and Lyft are you know, uh, 10 billion plus dollar companies. And he invested pretty much actually at the pre-seed stage. What's the highest cash on cash multiple you've seen in any seed fund? What are the records? I'm curious. I think people Chris- talk about Chris. Chris- Saka. Saka. Yeah. Were yeah. you in that or no? That no, it was, before I, it was before I started, unfortunately. So but, what is that know, one was an $8 million fund or a $9 million fund yeah. that had Uber and Twitter in it. And Instagram. And Instagram. Um, what did that wind I, up doing? I think 250x. 250x. Wow. Cash on cash. So yeah. $1 turns to $250 in that fund. A million in that fund turns into $250 million. And that's not exactly. percent for people who are listening. It's X, which I frequently have to remind people because when you're on CNBC, they think you're talking about percentages. No, exactly. And, you know, that's the funny thing about when you talk to later stage or actually public equity guys, they're talking about getting, you know, 10%. IRRs and you know venture if it works well it's substantially above that um, it's a different d- risk reward profile of course but you know I think the other who was thing after re- that do you think who do you think was after that I'm curious you know uh, I am fishing I, here a bit for the audience but yeah I'm just curious no, who's the next <laughs> I mean I, I just think about our fund managers Mucker you know as I mentioned is like a 27 I think they'll end up being a 30x fund uh, that first fund and you know. If you think about the kind of carry that generates, that's life-changing carry. And you know, my main point with that is that you don't need to have a five hundred million dollar fund to to create personal wealth. You can do extremely well with small funds. Tim Connors, you know, every single one of what his is funds Tim Connors' is fund? Pivot North. Pivot North. And he it basically invests one million dollars for twenty percent ownership. And you know, he's in companies like Chime and uh, and Looker at the seed stage. And you know, he has a phenomenal track record. He's very disciplined at 35 million and, you know, he can create great personal wealth and also returns for his investors. Um, and these, so in you, order for these funds to work, these seed, pre-seed funds, the smaller ones, they need to have one fund manager, two fund managers. What is the ideal dollars yeah. to fund manager? And Good question. Who, yeah. We actually track that. So I, I would say that on average, it's about 25 to 35 million of capital per partner. And uh, so, you know, you'd see a, a two person firm as having maybe 60 million hmm. or so, 60, 70 million. And the other interesting thing is that, you know, in general, it's about one new investment per partner per quarter. And so, if you had a two person firm over a three year period, that's about 24 investments. A three person firm might have 36 investments. Um, so, that's how we see it. And our, our single GPs, the, the, man, the funds that have one person, they're typically doing 12 to 15 investments. What, what, how do you look at those single GPs, I wonder? Do you look at them and that's a concern? Is it a feature? Is it a bug? We, you know, to be honest, we, we, a lot of LPs don't like single GP funds. And, and don't I know it? And, and you know, it's, it could be, a, uh, you know, one reason is, well, what happens if they get hit by the bus? Right. But, you know, the fact is that limited partner agreement, you know, the documents, uh, the financing documents basically have provisions for that. So if someone gets incapacitated, you know, you can replace them and manage out the fund. I think the bigger issue about a single GP fund is that there's not another pair of eyes looking at an investment decision. So a fund manager could fall in love with a company and just start throwing money after good money after bad. And Uh. so that's the bigger question for us. But, you know, a lot of guys mitigate it because they have advisory boards. They have a lot of uh, friends in the industry. Yeah, they they could go rogue, I guess, is the issue. Exactly. And the the issue with partners is they could get divorced. 
So they can get divorced it. or it becomes very political. I think oh. th- partnerships of three are probably ideal uh, if, you're, if you're going to have multiple partners. When you get to six or seven, you're kind if, of insinuating it could be tribal. Yeah. I'll support your follow on if you support mine. Ooh. See, that's, right? this is why I'm a solo guy. I think yeah. two people try to play the guitar at the same time or two people try to write the lyrics to the song, unless you're Lennon McCartney, like <laughs> don't think it's working out, right? It's, right? it's just too hard to get two people to think, you know, and collaborate on that level well. And so I just built a team around myself. Um, but it, it makes me feel good that your second, the, the second highest you know is the marker guys, because I put 600K or so to work when I was a scout at Sequoia. And that became worth over 100 million. Maybe it will wind yeah, up being 120. Amazing. So I think right. I'm in the almost 150, 200 X clubs. I'm behind my friend Chris Saka, but okay, he's kind of so retired. Number two. Well, yes. no, I think Ron Conway's probably <laughs> in there, but and and Bill Lee, um, who was a seed investor in Tesla and SpaceX. I, I think he's probably like anonymous, so not on the board. Right. And then I got to think Ron Conway's up there somewhere, but I don't know. I heard his fund with the Google in it. He didn't have like a, a meaningful percentage. You know, so all I know is what's been work. reported in the press, and yeah. I think re- it, it was publicly reported that it basically returned the fund, but that's about it uh-huh. because um, ownership was low, and there were a lot of companies in that internet bubble that didn't work out. Uh, okay. What is the um, change that you're seeing? Right. And what has your last 90 days been like? Because- okay. This has got to be a terrorizing time for somebody like yourself who's making a bet on the early stage. Early stage companies are like little baby turtles going to the ocean. Like <laughs> they can get scooped up by seagulls and any other creatures, just pick them off as they go into the ocean. And you're like running an entire hatchery <laughs> of sea turtles. What has the last 90 days been like for you? Yeah. I think ultimately, I think people really don't know how things are going to turn out. I mean, they can wave their hands and say, we've done the triage. We looked at co- meeting, you know, they looked at their portfolios, which companies have how much runway, thinking about value drivers versus, you know, their smaller investments that aren't doing as well. Um, and that's really what triage is so that you can identify the companies you want to support and make sure that they have the capital to succeed. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, really people do not know what the top line is going to look like. You know, I mean, we're talking 38 million people have filed unemployment. And, you know, I think people have been using their stimulus checks to pay rent. And, you know, that might have worked in April and May, but June and July, they may not start paying rent. And so a lot of negative, I think there's going to be a lot more negative news on the economic front. Um, But, you know, the volatility in the stock market, that directly impacts, I think, the later stage guys because they're actually thinking about what kind of returns they can make on their late stage investments. It's a little bit less as you get down to Series B, Series A. And then, to be honest, at the seed stage, you know, we we talk to our fund managers monthly. And so we've been hearing, you know, a number of them talking about uh, the new rounds that they see. And, you know, for the most part, you know the round sizes are about the same, somewhere between two to three million. But actually, the uh, the va- the pre money has actually come down a bit. So that you know what that a- a- actually means is that the founder is giving up more of the company. So, so instead, instead of, of twelve million, fifteen. Exactly. Instead of three on twelves, we're seeing three on nines or even three on sixes. How quaint! So, That's what it was when I started in the business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, when I did Mahalo, it was three on I think an eleven or twelve post with Sequoia. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. I mean, that's that's what we really want to see, and I think part of the the the, va- the increase in valuations um, is because there's been so many seed funds coming into the market, right? Since, like, as I said, you know, when I started, there's probably ten to fifteen, and now people are talking eight eight to nine hundred in the U.S. alone, and so. So wait know, a second. You're, you're saying when you started, there were two dozen, and now there might be something like five hundred of them, like seven. To eight, eight to nine hundred is what I hear. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that's actually not a great thing, but it is. It depends on who you are. If you're an entrepreneur, you know, certainly there are a lot more sources of capital, and you know, uh, so I think being an entrepreneur is is extremely difficult. But from a financing perspective, you should be able to at least get going. And having so many firms out there, and to be honest, you know. The, the barrier to entry to becoming a seed fund is relatively low. If you're like three people from Facebook, three engineers that made up 
let's say a million dollars, $2 million each, and you pull that together, suddenly you're a $6 million seed fund or a $6 million pre-seed fund. So you know, I think the barriers of entry have been low. I think right now it's a, um, a pretty tough time to raise new capital for a fund manager. Yeah, that was and my so, next question. Last year, yeah. how many new fund managers did you meet with? Because I, uh, well, I, I guess I can't talk about things, but uh, let's just say if uh, my, what I heard from my friends is that there were, un my friends who are LPs, that they were getting hammered with a just an unbelievable deluge of new fund managers yep. last year. Well, you know, if you're a VC, you're probably meeting three companies, four companies a day, perhaps, or somehow, you know, filtering through three to four a day. I would say that from an LP perspective, you know, we probably talk to uh, or meet with, you know, th about three a day. So 15 a week. So times like 50 is like 700. And that's like... And then so how many do you add a year versus take out or, or yeah, have you so ever it, taken ones out? Yeah. I mean, we've, 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 we've actually not re-upped with two of our best performing fund managers. What? Because, they retired? So, uh, you know, no, they actually became series A funds or multi-stage funds. So substantially larger. It's not the strategy that my LPs want us to do. So sadly, we did not re-up with them, but, you know, we love them. Um, and what I would say is that I think, you know, um, that we're meeting five to 700 new funds a year or, 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 or staying in touch with five to 700 groups. And that's both in the U S and worldwide. Um, and so I think we have a pretty good sense of the seed stage market, uh, globally. Um, and we are adding new managers because I mentioned one pilot, a year, two a year. What is the, well, our, our what pilot is the goal? program? Yeah. Oh, Our we pilot have the pilot program, program now, yeah. Allows us to do at least 15 new managers, five from seed, five from pre seed, five from international. And that's, yeah. but that's over a course of three years. So that's probably two to three new ones a year. Our most recent new, new fund manager is uh, Katie Stanton. At oh, yeah, Moxie. of course. Katie's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. We did and that so as a pilot. Those quick little $1 million checks are like a feeler bet. You get to yeah. build a relationship. So it's interesting you say that because my friend who I was talking to, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, found after multiple meetings with the largest that they take three or four funds to get to know a manager before making a decision. The sales cycle for some of the big institutions and LPs is in two, three, four funds they get to know a manager. Right. Is that, how long does it take you to get to know a manager typically? Putting aside the $1 million. You know, um, I would say that, no, I, I, I think we could do it within 30, 30 days. Wow. So this is such days. a competitive advantage for you because these other big funds take like literally, whatever, five years to get to know a fund. And they right. cha don't I mean, change any out per year. You know, Kirsten Green, Roger Ehrenberg, you know, uh, Tim Connors and Jeff Clavia I've known for a long time. Eric Renala at Mucker I, I've known for a long time. Uh, Mark Sugarman at MHS Capital, you know, we we met with him and pretty much committed to him within 30 days. Uh, Ashmeet Sadana at Engineering Capital, the same. You know, Larry Hippo, those guys, we, um, I, 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 I met with them once, spent time with them. Within 30, 40 days, we were committed to them. So I'm not saying a fast check is what we are, uh, right. but, I, but I would say that we're not social proof investors. We're not afraid to be first and we're not afraid to write a, a big check to something that we like. How do you deal with the direct invests and competing in a way with your uh, fund? So if I was a fund and I had a 10% allocation in a company that's doing a series B and it's a $30 million series B and I've got a $3 million check, but my fund can't cover it. Am I giving you my allocation and splitting the carry with so. you? Or how is that working? Well, in, in an ideal world, uh, we're investing in Series B. That's sort of our target. And you know, our fund managers as seed investors don't have the fund size to, to write a full pro rata check typically at Series B. And that's, that actually creates an intrinsic advantage for us to co-invest with them. Um, you know, the seed investors have known the founders from the beginning, so they have a very tight relationship, and and typically they're able to get us in. Um, you know, our our, our co-investment program is pretty modest. Our current fund is thirty five million, so we're writing two million dollar checks to eighteen companies, and so you know, I think um, we, the the biggest thing that we worry about is adverse selection. 
why am I being shown this opportunity? Ah. And, so, and so, you know, we try to mitigate that by requiring that our fund managers are investing in the same round as, that, as we are, and also that, there's, um, that we're not bridging so that there's a new outside lead. Right. And that's important because somebody's done all that diligence and they feel confident and you get to follow along with that. What are the companies that are going to succeed coming out of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Do you think the world changes radically forever in 2021, 2022, or are we back to normal? What is your gut telling you? You know, I, I think there's a complete disconnect with the equity markets, and that's being driven by Microsoft and Fang. Um, I think that you know, fundamentally, there's a lot of pain in the streets, and you know, I think um, you know, you could argue that well, the 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 bulk of the people who have been laid off are actually um, on the relatively lower end of the economic scale because it's restaurant and hospitality and travel. But uh, I think ultimately, with work from home, the corporates are going to realize they don't need all these people. And so, you know, I, I think that you're going to see a, a wave of white collar uh, job elimination. So and true. And nobody's talking about this, but I'm seeing it in my own companies where they were fighting to get this extra, you know, VP in and, and get the board to approve some amount of like exceptional out of line options. And here we are nine months later, 18 months later, and they're saying, yeah, we're laying this person off. It's just too expensive. Right. And, and. And the issue is that the U.S. is about seventy. The U.S. economy is about seventy percent uh, driven by, you know, discretionary consumer spend. And so, you know, if they're, you're start starting to reduce that, that's a, a material impact on on all companies, not not just the ones that you think about in the startup land, uh, you know, travel and hospitality that are being materially impacted. It, enterprise software companies actually, you know, you, you really got to keep an eye on the renewal rates because they just very mel very well may not renew. And so I don't think any company in any sector is, is, is immune to this. I mean, certainly there's some that have tailwinds. Um, but, you know, I, I think in general, we're, and that's why I preface a lot of this by saying no one really knows. And I'm not going to try to pretend that I do, but you can see, I think, s certain elements that really are, are very worrisome. And so that white collar, slow uh, cutting of white collar jobs, we're talking, you know, above 75K a year, 70K a year, whatever it is, 60, 70, 80K a year, those are getting cut because if you're working from home, your thesis is the managers start to realize who actually is getting stuff done, who's GSD and who's not. It's so funny. You have the same exact observation I've been talking about on this podcast recently because I think a large portion of old school management, which you and I were part of as Gen Xers, I believe we're both Gen Xers, I know I am, was like, you know, who got in first to the office, who, who left latest, who came back after they went to the gym, who was here on Saturday. People used to judge a company by how, you know, VCs would judge a company by how filled the parking lot was on Saturday and Sunday. Right. Uh, and that would be the company stock you wanted to buy. And you, once you get people working from home, you actually look at the work they're doing and you're like, what What did you get done today? Give me a list. Yeah. And I, I think it also you have to bifurcate that between the developers and also just the management types because actually our fund managers have been working with their CEOs to track the number of key strikes, key strokes that their developers are doing. And they've noticed that it's actually increased uh, because of work of work from home. What's the thesis there? Why would it increase if they're working from home? I have my I get because they don't they don't have the distraction of hanging out at the water cooler, right? right. So they're just cranking. And there's another one to GSD. They're know? just GSDing because so. they don't have to go to the water cooler, or somebody yeah. just doing that stupid gopher thing where they pop up, and then you're like, "Why are you interrupting the entire team?" And it's like, <laughs> "I saw a viral video." It's like, "Why are you looking yeah, exactly. at viral videos, dummy?" Um, yeah, but the management team is what you got to wonder about. Do you need like your example that extra VP? And maybe the answer is no. And if you're a public company, you know maybe you don't need 20 assistant vice presidents. Yeah, this was a problem when I was at AOL. John Miller and was talking to me about how many EVPs he had and how many SVPs there were. And right, uh, just it was out of control. And they because they had a money printing machine, you didn't really look at human capital. You looked at the culture, and you're like, well. You can't really get rid of that guy who gets paid three hundred grand a year, right. because he's been here so long. What what I would also tell you is that um, our fund managers are talking about how a lot of their companies are not going to re renew their leases, and so uh. I think there's going to be a major impact on cons cons uh, commercial real estate. And in fact, some of our fund managers are not going to renew their leases on their own offices. So I think 
you know, that's a, a material step. It's not like saying, okay, we're going to take the year and work from home. It's actually, we're going to give up our office. Right. That's like fully committing. That's, yeah. that's, uh, what are they, that's like burning the boats. You know, you land at the new world and you're like, burn the boats. We're staying. Right. We're not going back. Ex- we're going to, exactly. we're going to make this work in the new world. Um, and do you think, oh, by the way, my other thesis, um, to close the loop is that because people aren't commuting, they are gaining, what, 90 minutes a day, three hours a day. I don't know what the average commute is. Maybe let's just pick 45 minutes. There's 90 minutes gained a day, which right. means people might stay an extra half hour or start a half hour early or whatever it is. Um, and then the line between when you're working and when you're not has blurred so much because your office is at home. Right. It used to be people came home and during that half hour, 45 minute hour long commute, they reset their world and they were now in family mode. It was like a buffer, right? It was a, a buffer, transition. a transition buffer, exactly. And so, you know, you get home after your commute, you're like, that's it. This is now family time. I am not doing anything but my family or me or whatever it right. is. Whereas now, yeah. I couldn't even tell you the day of the week. Like, do you know what day yeah, it is today? But you know, what month it is? I mean, it's all like, blurring. You and I and VCs and LPs, we all, you know, pretty much work straight 24-7, right? Right. Um, and, but, you know, the other thing about work from home, obviously, is that, you know, not everyone has the ability to take care of their children while they're working. And so schools provided that function. And if the schools aren't opening, then you have serious issues. That's so. a serious, serious issue. And yeah. uh, I I don't know how that gets resolved, especially here in Northern California, where we seem to be the least impacted by COVID-19 because we right. started early and people here respect the lockdown like crazy. Right. There's been like no cases in Northern California and no deaths, like so de minimis compared to like, I think we've had a total number of deaths that equals like the lightest day in New York during this crisis. Yeah. Uh, like literally our total is the same as, you know, yesterday. San Francisco, I think is 34. And deaths. I think New York this past week has been 30 to 50. So literally one day of the 100 day crisis in New York is the right. entirety of San Francisco. So yeah, getting back to work is predicated on having teach having people be able to have their kids go to school or have help because you can't yeah. have help come to the house either if you could afford that, you know, because you're in quarantine. You're not allowed to be have help even. No, I know. And so, but I, I would say that our fund managers are basically make uh, are making investments without meeting people in person. And, you know, they can kind of triangulate and tight uh, and, uh, through talking to other investors who might have known them or obviously doing a lot of reference checking. And maybe at the end of the day, you'll go and do a social distance walk or two. Um, but, you know, our, our guys are actually uh, writing checks to people that they've never met in person. Thank God I have the accelerator because that's a 100K check. And I, with such a small check size there for a decent chunk of equity, it's a pretty good deal if you can run an exceptional accelerator. Yep. I, get to, I get to get to really have a 16-week Zoom relationship. So it's almost like the 100K is the same as your million-dollar feeler bet into Katie's right. fund. It's like, yeah, just see what this feels like. Let's see if it works. Let's see if we vibe. Let's see how she does right. you know, evaluating companies and what the companies say about having her on the cap table, right? You get to just- have a uh, I mean and, and 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 exactly on that point you know our fund managers are are also talking about doing small checks kind of as a pilot to start working with someone and not writing that one and one and a half million dollar check but maybe a 200k check to see and 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 then ultimately converting that into a bigger check in the next round but one major dynamic that we haven't talked about that's been going on for about the last 12 to 18 mm-hmm. months is that, you know, you had a resurgence of the series A funds coming in and leading seed rounds. And so that was actually a real threat to some of our fund managers where someone like Founders Fund or Lightspeed would come in and write a $4 million check at 16 pre. Whereas everyone, all the other seed funds were talking about doing like three on nine, right? And so the founders are like, well, we're going to take the we're going to take the larger round, and we'll be off to the races. And so that was actually a, a, a material impact on some of our fund managers. And part of the reason for that is because these larger firms, you know, the 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 junior partners or the principals, they wouldn't have to get full investment committee approval to write a three million dollar check, right? If you're a billion dollar fund. You know, it's a lighter approval process to write a three million dollar check than right. a five million uh, than a twenty million dollar check. So we were seeing a lot of that. That kind of pulled back a little bit, um, thankfully. Uh, 
And, you know, I would say that back in 2015 and 16, if you remember like Greylock's Discovery Fund or Andreessen was doing a lot of seed or Excel was doing a lot of seed, they actually pulled back from that as well because, you know, they were realizing that they were writing a lot of checks to groups and they wouldn't know all the company names or the CEOs. And then in the Series A, if they weren't leading, that would be a negative signal to the rest of the Series A funds. And, you know, that, that would negatively impact the company's fundraising. And it also, what I heard, and again, I'll, I'll use the term like charitable or cynical, the, the, the cynical view of a lot of that was some of those funds were saying, you know what, I, I don't even want to take the Series A bet because what if they don't win and somebody else wins? So I don't know, there's blue jeans and Zoom and you're like, I'm not so sure about, I got blue jeans, I could give, I could do the Series A right now, but I don't want to miss hitting a Zoom with my growth fund or my series C or D round, you know, or my late stage fund. So therefore I'm just going to wait and not commit unless, because I'm afraid that I, if we make a bet on the lift in this equation, we don't get Uber or blue jeans. We don't get zoom. Have you heard of that theory of what some of the bigger funds that have, you know, multi-stage. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think now? that, you know, Sequoia is by far the greatest venture capital firm ever. And they're so smart. Um, and also ability to to manage through generations of great investors. It's, it's truly phenomenal. And if you look at sort of their stack of funds, they have early, they have seed stage, they have early stage, they have growth. And then on top of it, they have their global growth fund. And I think that's just so smart because they might have missed or not done Zoom at the early stage, but then they went, you know, backed up the truck for, for the later stage and they did phenomenally well with that investment. Uh, so what do you think are the companies and the verticals coming out of this that might benefit? This is a, a question that's been coming up, or is it too soon to tell what companies actually benefit? There are obviously ones like telemedicine or work from home tools. Do you see anything else out there besides those two obvious ones? F oh, food delivery, like, okay, we get it. It's a pandemic, but who knows if that lasts? Is there anything else emerging that's non-obvious? I mean, you know, I think, uh, one way to think about this, perhaps, is that um, the COVID and sheltering in place has really accelerated a lot of trends. And so you looked at the stats that came out on Instacart, for example, how they surpassed Walmart and grocery uh, in the past few months. So, you know, certain things have accelerated. You know, when we invested in, in Forerunner back in 2012, they were talking about how 3% of retail is done online. But now, you know, obviously with sheltering in place, it's skyrocketed like 16 to 20%. Um, the question is whether that's sustainable. And I think, you know, more and more people are finding it, it, it's always hard for, you know, people living in our little bubble that uh, it's, a, it's a, perhaps a daunting thing to execute something online or transact online. And, you know, because it's like second nature to a lot of us. But, you know, it, it, as more and more people do it out of necessity, I think they, uh, you know, they realize how great that is. So, yeah, like it's actually like my parents have never ordered from Instacart. And my brother had never ordered from Instacart and they were still going to the stores <laughs> during the right. New York City pandemic. Yeah. I said, this has to stop. Download the following three apps. Right. Like, what are right. you doing? <laughs> like you, and you even have Mercado in New York delivering from like uh, a and pork store and like you can get rice balls and managot and you know, all the good mutts and like, <laughs> everything's available. What are you doing? Right. You don't have to, I have one that I, I just realized in talking to you. And one of the reasons I even do this podcast to get smart people on here like you and just chop it up and hash things out because it gives me right after, I, um, well, I, I write all these notes while we're talking oh. and people are like, oh my God, thanks for the podcast. It changed my life. I'm like, by the way, every podcast episode pretty much changes my life too. <laughs> uh, Cause I realized something and I just realized self-improvement uh, and the the little bit of all this free time people got during the pandemic that they filled with a hobby. Um, we saw companies like Calm uh, for meditation and self improvement there, and Equanimity and Sleep, et cetera, do very well during this. Uh, Steezy, our dance company, Fitbod, our cross fitness company, musician, uh, music, yeah. construction, tone we're in freestyle, and they're in Steezy also. Yes, we introduced um, uh, them to it, and thank uh, you. Yeah, well, they, you know, um, Josh and, and Dave, uh, and jo Josh is coming on the podcast to talk about mental health, by the way. He, he hasn't been on yet, I don't think. But Dave's That's been great. on twice, um, yep. and they're doing great things there. But the, 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 some of those companies are just going gangbusters because I think with, a, with an, a large number of people unemployed, 
they're going to, the, I believe in the human spirit and I believe they will want to improve themselves during right. that downtime to try to find jobs and to just generally be better humans um, and improve themselves just generally speaking. So all the educational opportunities in every possible vertical are what I'm looking for. I'm looking for more people who want to teach me something for 10 bucks a month or a hundred dollars a year. Like if you have that, email me now. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think the online in. learning and, and, you know, you might even have a uh, certification in, you know, say inside sales. And instead of getting a whole MBA online, you're actually going to get a sort of that narrow vertical and, and be certified for that. So, you know, I, I think in, in general, it's just accelerating a lot of trends that were out there. And, you know, um, I would also add that, that, you know, basically because of the connectivity, um, there's just an amazing amount of data that's being generated. And to be able to titrate through that to get insight and some learnings, I think that's going to be super critical. And so, you know, that might be mar marketing, mar martech and, you know, marketing technology, ad tech, a lot of that has always been kind of out of favor, I suppose, in the last five, eight years. But, you know, I think that'll come back. Um, and, you know, I think AI is not a space. I think AI permeates everything horizontally. And I think there, there'll be a lot more interesting com companies coming out of that. For sure. You know, the interesting thing is Robinhood, which we were in this, I don't know, 20 or $30 million round for that one. That's one right. I might need to sell 10% of my shares, uh, but it just keeps going up. So I can't yeah. sell. I can't sell. Our guys at SUSE are in that at the, yeah, at, that at level. the seed stage. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's going to be, I mean, that one could return my first fund. Um, Calm, that one, Desktop Metal. Those are all potentially just fun. We're in, we're in those with you. Desktop Metal with the Founder of Collective guys and yeah. Calm through uh, Trubic. Actually. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, that, that's actually going to be our biggest win of all time, I predict, even bigger than Uber. Calm? Yeah, because we we put in $378,000 when it was a four or $5 million round. So we own 5% oh, of the company. Amazing. Yeah. That's well, amazing. Higher, we, that, I mean, that is an interesting, and it was, you know, when we've talked about my strategy, and you've given me some great advice. Um, in my first and second fund, we were doing those single bets. And I had Elizabeth on from uh, Hustle Fund, which I think you're an LP right. in. No, we're not, not but we know, we know them well. Yeah, yeah. so and we were just talking about it, and she was asking me all these questions about, while I was interviewed, she was asking how we're increasing our percentage ownership, and she's where I was on my first fund or two, which is just like, hey, we write a 50, 100K check, and then we move on to the next thing. Right. But we've started to now do four or five investments, uh, and now we're investing in a Series B at 150 million and putting like probably 3 million into it, and we were the original seed stage people. So we were increasing our percentage ownership at a hundred fifty million dollar round, wow! Yeah, wow. it's kind of a weird kind of thing. But just watching what Sequoia did with WhatsApp, and um, I was in one of those funds that had WhatsApp in it, and it was just like, wow, they did every round of the fu of funding. When you see a fund manager doing that, how do you determine if they're not covering a mistake? <laughs> Right, because well, they're not supposed to do every round, right? You would want outside capital. You mentioned before, or they're just being super savvy. Like I mean, we're talking about adverse selection, right? Why am I being shown this? Well, in the case of WhatsApp, they they were not showing that to anybody, and so right. you know that's one thing. And then the other is that you know Sequoia is a partnership of a lot of people. It's not a single GP mm. just putting good money after bad. So fair point. You know, I think a, it was a, t a team decision, and it was a phenomenal what a investment decision. for them. Oof. Yeah, uh, Robinhood jumped from 10 million subscribers to 13 million, I'm sorry, users. And I don't know what percentage of them are on pro accounts, but it's got to be 5, 10% or something. I wish I knew that actual number. I don't have any inside uh, information. Um, yeah, they recovered pretty nicely from their hiccups, right? They had two or three days of outages. Those, uh, those uh, That's my hope days. for every of one of my companies. Every company, like when you look at Twitter, like there is nobody who knows what the fail well is at this point. Like we all know the fail well because yeah. we loaded Twitter, but like 99% of people on Twitter today, <laughs> if you said, what's the fail well, they would be like, I don't know. Explain it to me. Like, Right, right. Although with Robin Hood, you have a slightly bigger thing at stake than not being able to tweet because <laughs> not being able to trade, you could I have mean, serious damages. I, I mean, uh, uh, I, I would say that Robinhood is an extremely valuable property, and you saw the consolidation of the consumer, um, you know, stock trading companies, and so you know, I think they're going to be a very valuable target. Uh, very yes. I, I mean, who, what, would, who would be the acquirer that would make the most brilliant acquisition ever by buying them? If you had to pick <laughs> somebody, somebody who's not in finance, mm, that's the best buyer, right? Because they will it's overpay. Be Facebook. 
Facebook buying Robinhood. Because then they wow. can roll out part of Libra with that, and, <gasps> you know, and they have all the data and certainly they can Ooh. market that. So. Wow. Facebook buys. Let's get it done. Robinhood for $20 billion. Yeah. That That'll would be, be I mean, I always thought Amazon should buy Uber. I thought that was like the no-brainer, bold acquisition. And I mean, something right. like that could still happen with Lyft or, or Uber since they're not like skyrocketing right now. They're, and I always thought Apple should buy Tesla or, or Google with their self-driving horn should buy Tesla. But man, they missed the boat on that too. I mean, a Slack, Dropbox, and Airtable. How are those not owned by Microsoft right now or Apple? Or those three companies should combine and then be a viable alternative to Microsoft and Salesforce. Oh, Slack buying Airtable. Asana is going to go public. So you yeah, have Asana, Slack, Airtable. Who else would you put in there? Maybe a, a storage company like Dropbox. Oh yeah, Dropbox. yeah, Dropbox for sure. And Dropbox, yeah, Dropbox and a Dropbox Slack merger would be magical. Yes, that would be magical uh, because yeah. all of those corp. Each corporate client could then just add the other product. There's probably only 10, 30, 10, 20, 30% overlap. And so you take a short term hit to give everybody both products for one price. Yeah. And if, you know, Salesforce has been very innovative, but, you know, you look at their integration of Tableau, it's non existent. And, you know, they obviously acquired Tableau, but it's still not an integrated product. So, you know, I think there's always opportunities for startups. And that's why, you know, people say, well, you know, out of downturns, great companies can get formed. And part of the another way of saying that, obviously, is that, that you know you can't time technology innovation, right? This this will be the best time to invest as an early stage investor. The the moment we're in right now for the next three years, this is the best time to deploy capital. Correct? Yes, exactly. Why? And, uh, Explain to the audience why this seems completely illogical that you would want to push chips in during a pandemic, during a market crash recession, whatever we're in right now. You know, when I was a little kid, I wanted to win the Nobel Prize in literature. And then I actually looked at all the winners. And, you know, a lot of them had gone through really constrained lives, like Solzhenitsyn, for example. And, you know, as as the perfect example of someone who was in jail. And, you know, I think when there's an abundance of capital and uh, it, it's relatively easy to get, I think it teaches a lot of bad habits and whether that's, you know, spending a lot on Facebook ads or Instagram ads or whatever. But, you know, I think when you're in a more resource constrained environment, you have to, it actually spurs creativity. Right. And so, you know, I think um, there'll be very, there's, there'll be a ton of younger people who are going to be great founders out there and they just don't know it. Um, or, uh, and, and then also I think, you know, the nuts and bolts of things, a lot, th a lot of things are going to be a lot cheaper hiring people. If you get office space, then, you know, re uh, commercial, uh, rents are going to go down. So I think it's, it's an actually, um, on the one hand, a more constrained environment that's going to spur creativity, but on the expense side, you may not need as much capital and, you know, Uber's round that you were in, right. It was, uh. What, it was like 2009, one and a half on I four? think. Yeah. One and a half on four, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It was uh, pretty crazy. Um, and I didn't take my pro rata. Oh. Oi. Oi. Well, <laughs> you know, the Sequoia Scouts program specifically didn't have pro rata as an option. And Ruloff was like, if you want to take the pro rata, you're welcome to it. We don't, we can't do pro rata in the syndicate. I'm sorry, in the, uh, because if we do it, then it's going to be a signaling issue. So Scouts in, runs independently of everything. And right. Yeah. What are your thoughts on those scout programs? You know, I think it, it really, you know, you would know better than I, but I think it does uh, add a lot of value to the the, the sponsoring firm. Um, it really becomes a question of, does that translate into a material check for them? And, um, you know, I think it's there's a balance between keeping the identity somewhat, uh, you know, not public because, you know, you know, I, I think... If Sequoia was involved, to use them as example, at the seed stage through a scout, and they don't lead the A, that could send a negative signal. So I, 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 I would think about those kind of issues. But in general, it seems like you know that they've been a, a pretty creative overall.
All right. This has been amazing. Thank you, Michael Kim. Everybody follow Michael on MK Rocks on the Twitter. Thanks so much for doing the pod. I hope you stay safe. Yeah. Um, and Very uh, fun to chat with you. Yeah. It was great to catch up. I'm so lonely. I'm so <laughs> lonely. I just want my friends back and I want to I want to see you all perfect and give you a hug. And But I mean, when are you going to, this is a very personal question. When are you going to feel comfortable sitting outside at a restaurant Having a nice lunch outside. That's a good question. When um, would you would you go would you go to lunch this weekend if you were sitting well, outside and everybody to other tables six feet away? Would you do that? You know, the answer is yes. Uh, I would. In too. fact, I was in Colorado for the past two and a half weeks, and we would go to dinner parties and we would have cocktails. And maybe it's our quarantine team where we knew the family and uh-huh. know that they're not sick. Um, right. But as for going to a restaurant uh, and sitting outside, I, I think there's no issue with it, to yeah. be honest. And quarantine. We, I like that. It's the first time I've heard <laughs> that. So you have your quarantine. Were you exactly. in Boulder or were you in Denver? We were in Aspen, actually. Oh, okay. And you Beautiful. know, restaurants that opened. Oh, you mentioned that, yeah. Yeah. And so it was a nice time. Oh, people and were inside the restaurants? No. Well, yes, we weren't, but uh, restaurants were open inside. <gasps> but wow. you know, in Aspen, there's this very outdoor culture. And right. so there are a lot of restaurants outside. Yeah, see, I think that this could be rethinking cities a bit because the city you and I um, uh, right. uh, live in and or uh, work, live in, live and or work in um, is a mess right now. It could be an amazing boom, um, I think, for our industry if rents went down thirty percent. Still, be the most expensive rent in the United States, I think. But boy, is it going to be amazing if all these office spaces are empty? We need to convert and- them into residential. And repurposed. Yeah, totally. Exactly. I mean, what are we going to do with all this office space? It's crazy. And then what is San Francisco going to do if Twitter, Square, you know, and and any number of other companies decide to not renew their lease or go down to half the amount of space as work from home companies, that means the tax basis is going to collapse in a city that is already overspending and underperforming. Yeah, I mean, you look at McKesson, they actually moved to Dallas, right? And so uh, that was actually one of the largest companies in San Francisco. Chevron moved out also to the East Bay. And so, you know, I, I, I worry for San Francisco that um, that the, the gravy train of tax tax revenue is going to slow down and they're not going to be able to, to adjust accordingly. It's a startup and they have to manage their cash burn, right? Yeah. They have and retain workers. So, I mean, you can just view the city as a startup. And right now, San Francisco has a high burn rate and the revenues are, are probably peaking in, or peaked and now on the decline. And, and the so product itself crashes. Is, yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. like we're getting the spinning wheel of death in more ways than one in this city. Like if the product sucks, then, you know, you, you could expect the churn is going to be high. And the product kind of sucks right now. And the churn is... I mean, how many people do you know who've decamped and are coming back? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Dave Samuel, and he mentioned that he he announced this publicly, but he's moving to the East Coast. He's moving out of to the Bay Area. What? And so, I didn't yeah, know that wow. He's moving to Maine, and you know that's uh, it's a loss for I think um, Bay Area entrepreneurs because he won't be able to work with them directly in person. But I think it also is a you know to take a, a very uh, clinical look. He's a, 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 a person of means who's now exiting the tax base. Right. right. That's less tax. He's, he's going to be a high tax payer who pays for God knows how many, you know, uh, kids, school, public service, roads, whatever. Uh, right. You know, his taxes pay for it. It's, it's a really phenomenal. My thesis on all this is that I see the green shoot as the companies that make it through this are going to be so wildly efficient because they'll master distributed and right. salaries are going to go down 30% because of market conditions and because you don't pay the San Francisco premium. Right. People will stay at companies longer and so turnover is going to go down and you're going to be able to hire people faster and it's going to be a more attractive job because they can work from anywhere. Exactly. I think you'll see less churn, right? Because yes. they're not spending 90 minutes on a, a commute. They're living in Portland or wherever, you know, some, some bucolic place and enjoying their lives better and spending more time with their family instead of in the car. Right. So they're happier. So they stay longer. They're more productive. They get paid less, but they're happier. And right. that is really the unlock is if people can get, if a company can pay less and get more, if they get two employees for every one they would get in San Francisco, 
well, what do you think is going to happen to this market here? It's 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 going to be shaky. All right, listen, uh, All right. Michael, I could keep, I could talk to you for ten hours, and uh, listen, we talked for over an hour. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the pod. We'll have you back. Let's uh, let's book this as a yearly. I think this is such a good conversation. This has got to be a yearly, Nick. Let's put it on the put it on the clock, okay? Absolutely. Right. Uh, follow all Michael right. Kim, MK Rocks. We'll see you all next time on this week in startups. Bye bye. <laughs>